All right, welcome everybody uh, to this live session. I'm super grateful to be joined by Stephen Grimm and Caleb Coho. Uh, a bit up front, um, Caleb and Stephen had sent us a paper that we sent around on the PWAL listserv. You certainly do not have to have read uh, either of the papers actually that sent to, uh, but you might wanna know of their existence and we're gonna post links to those in the comments. Um, so you can go back and, and check out specific sections that get referenced. Um, but for now, we're going to have a conversation about those two papers, about what PWAL is, about what philosophy as a way of life is, and uh, about why you might want to live philosophically. Uh, I want to give really big, long introductions uh, and heap all the honor that Caleb and Stephen deserve. Uh, but one quick thing to note is that Stephen's uh, laptop battery might die for complicated reasons. So I don't want to waste any uh, of his minutes. Um, I'll just say uh, again that, that uh, Caleb and Stephen are on the advisory board for the PWAL uh, grants and have been founding towering figures in the PWAL movement and we're really grateful to have them. Um, I'm going to turn it over right now uh, to, let's see, Caleb, do you want to go first? Or did, did we decide a speaker order? I think I was going to start. All right, we're going to hand it over to Stephen. So I'll let you start. Um, and then again, there'll be questions throughout. So feel free to drop any questions you have in the Facebook comments thread. And we'll try to get to as many of those uh, as we can before the end of the session. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks a ton, Paul, for uh, the invitation. Great to see you, Caleb. So, so the complicated thing that why my laptop battery might die is there was a hurricane that's been brushing up the East Coast. And I'm in New York. And our power went out. Um, and we don't have a generator or anything. So. Um, so you actually might hear generators all around you from our neighbors. But anyway, we'll hope this goes well. So yeah, 2020, quite a year, right? <laughs> Just keeps getting weird. Um, so Good thing we have philosophy to help. <laughs> right, right. Um, so I'll mainly talk about the European Journal of Philosophy piece, and then Caleb will mainly talk about the meta philosophy piece. So just thinking about the title of the European uh, Journal of Philosophy piece that Caleb and I co-authored recently came out. It's called What is Philosophy as a Way of Life and Why Philosophy as a Way of Life? So think about that second question in particular, uh, why philosophy as a way of life? And uh, for me, at least, it helps to think of the possible contrasts uh, that you might have in mind with these terms. So why philosophy as a way of life uh, as opposed to what? And why philosophy as a way of life, again, as opposed to what? So the way I'm thinking of it, the way of life part, it's why philosophy as a way of life as opposed to an academic discipline, an academic discipline like economics or physics or um, history with its characteristic problems and puzzles. Um, philosophy for centuries has, uh, I think, had uh, different aspirations than that or sometimes often higher aspirations than that not just to solve certain characteristic problems or puzzles but to be somehow a guide to living well so it's that idea why, why philosophy as a way of life somehow as a guide and then the question would be why philosophy as a way of life as opposed to religion or as opposed to some other uh, tradition that you might have inherited from your community so uh, since we're philosophers, you know, we're zer zeroing in on our terms. And then Caleb and I were thinking more carefully than about, OK, what's this way of life that's not an academic discipline that somehow can be a guide to the good life? And the way we think about it in the paper is that a way of life, well, it's complicated, but it's grounded in what we call a vision of the good. So and by that, we mean especially a vision of, of a hierarchy of goods about uh, which goods are, are more and less important than each other's and maybe which goods are fundamentally or the most important. Whoops, sorry. Um, and uh, so your vision of the good, the good could have different things at the highest rank. It could have honor, it could have virtue, it could have authenticity, it could have autonomy. Um, that vision of the good will then, we, we argue, structure or different practices and rituals that flow out of it. So if you value authenticity, most of all, 
then the practices and rituals and the things that structure your life will look different than if you value honor most of all. Or if you value the family very high, highly, that will lead to a certain practices and rituals that again structure your life. At Notre Dame last summer, we had another twist in that tale where we talked about the original position where you might start. So maybe if the goal is authenticity, maybe you start with estrangement or inauthenticity. Maybe if the goal is autonomy, you start with heteronomy, something like that. So this vision of the good, uh, we think ways of life are based in, grounded in visions of the good, this hierarchy of goods. And um, then, uh, well, we could, let's kind of play off that a little, okay? Then the question of why, uh, what, so what would it mean for philosophy to be a way of life? Well, there's one way of thinking about this that Caleb and I consider at some length and then uh, wrestle with, but ultimately, you know, disagree with. And this would be, uh, so John Cooper's idea, which he thinks is in ancient philosophy, all the ancient philosophers about what it would mean for philosophy to be this, this um, guide to a way of life. And what Cooper says pretty straightforwardly is that for philosophy to be this guide to the vision of the good would be for philosophy that is like reason, reason alone, to be able to discern what's good, what's more or less important, and to provide the motivating, as it were, like uh, oomph to push you along to get to realize this vision of the good. And Caleb and I argue that uh, that's a mistake. And that when Pierre Hadot was talking about uh, the idea of spiritual exercises as being extremely important to ancient philosophy, um, we think that he was onto something deeply important. And uh, we think it, it, it's important in two different ways. So we argue that reason, pure reason, whatever exactly that means, is inadequate in terms of giving us like a full vision of the good. Uh, rational insight alone can't, as it were, spell that out for you. And that spiritual exercises, which could mean things like thinking about uh, exemplary figures in your tradition, uh, meditating, reading, it could be particular practices that the Stoics recommend, that all those things help us, as it were, to discern uh, what's more or less important, which goods are more fundamental and which aren't. And we also think that in terms of uh, motivational power, even if reason were for the sake of argument to give you this fully worked out vision of the good, we think that our passions and our appetites are such that they're just untutored. They're, they're going to fight against reason and um, that spiritual exercises help to educate them uh, in a way that so that they'll listen to reason. I mean, as that very language suggests, that's Aristotle's language, obviously. So we think we're being faithful uh, interpreters, not just of Aristotle, but we think this is widespread in the ancient world that they thought that think of Plato and how he stressed the importance of the kind of music you listen to, uh, the kind of physical exercise you engage in. On the Broadway, Caleb and I are thinking of spiritual exercises, listening to the right music, engaging in physical exercise, gymnastics or so on. Those could all have an important part in bringing the soul into proper order so that it listens to reason, so that it can help to discern the good uh, in particular. So you know, we think that um, was pervasive in ancient philosophy. Um, and we also think that if the idea of philosophy as a way of life is to have traction today, we think that that characteristic idea of spiritual exercises, of thinking about practices or disciplines, you know, thinking about exemplary figures, engaging in certain immersion experiences, we think that that's very important if philosophy is going to have this transformative effect on people that we often claim it does that, you know, the tradition has, has many times uh, claimed that it has. So um, 
so yeah, that's that's kind of the 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 first paper in a nutshell, the European Journal of Philosophy piece. Um, so why philosophy as a way of life? Because we think it's important to uh, guide people towards the good. Um, and uh, why? But but and it and when you think about it, the way we've th thought about it, where spiritual exercises, thinking about exemplary figures and so on could be important. We don't see the big contrast between philosophy as a way of life and some tradition based uh, way of life. It could be grounded in a religion. It could be grounded in, you know, is, is Confucianism say a religion? Maybe not, but it certainly orders a structured vision of the good. We think about what's more or less important and a certain inherited way of of uh, thinking about practices and rituals, which will help shape you uh, to pursue this. So I guess the last thought would be that uh, for us, and maybe this transitions well to the meta philosophy paper, uh, I think it became even more fruitful to think about uh, not philosophy as a noun, but what, it, you know, living, uh, not philosophy as a way of life, but a philosophical way of life or living philosophically as an adverb. And we became uh, more convinced that that was a more fruitful way to approach things. So before we uh, turn it over to Caleb, uh, Paul, I guess we, we were talked earlier in, in, in advance of this and maybe a potential question, like I'm sure you all have a lot of questions, but one question would be, so suppose you buy into that general story. Uh, what does that mean in the classroom, pedagogically? suppose you know what what would spiritual exercises look like in the classroom um could could they could they lead could they lead people in the wrong direction that's something that our paper leaves open you know could acting like a stoic for two or three days could that really make a dent in anybody's life or does it have to be like more sustained than that so anyway that's a question we've been thinking about too that's excellent. And I'm totally going to pitch it right back to you as soon as we get to the discussion section. So okay. yeah. I th I'm very, I'm very eager to hear what you have to say about it. I think that's a yeah. great question. For now, I'm going to, I'll turn it over to Caleb uh, so that you can uh, speak a bit about the meta philosophy paper and um, then we'll have some dialogue. Right. <clears throat> yeah. So following up on what Stephen was saying, we're rejecting the sort of pure reason um, view of philosophy as a way of life, but then that leaves the question, well, what are the conditions you need to meet? Um, and this is why you can bring up that uh, table now, Paul, thanks. So this uh, paper in Metaphilosophy gives our first pass at uh, answering that, where we set out three key conditions we think uh, would would be sufficient for living philosophically and con contrast those who are doing that including some who aren't aren't all the way there yet to being an, a sage or an exemplar um, with with uh, others who might be influenced by f different philosophies but but aren't really uh, living philosophically so the first condition uh, is the idea that First of all, there has to be a philosophy or a vision of the good, as, as Stephen was talking about there, that you need to be um, committed to a tr first a, a truth claim making worldview. So we think there's a, there's a difference if I'm going for an interview and my friend says I'm putting out good vibes in the universe and I ask, well, do you have a theory of vibes and the universe such that you're, you're doing that will... Uh, uh, improve my chances and then, then like no is a polite thing to say you know I'm trying to be encouraging uh, the, the, so there there's language we can use that that maybe is just practical and doesn't doesn't actually have a metaphysical commitment behind it that that wouldn't be philosophical um, whereas someone who says I'm I'm, I'm praying for you and I think like prayers are effective because of my of these commitments there there you've got some truth claims uh, out there um, and it also has to be value prescribing so there there are um, disciplines like say, physics or chemistry that makes a lot of truth claims but it's less clear that they get you to a vision of the good or something that's value prescribing now there are there are people who think that the 
the sciences, um, maybe including the social sciences and the natural sciences together um, would get you there. Um, th there's a question about if that were the case, then 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 those sciences could qualify. But quite possibly, a lot of sciences uh, make truth claims, but don't really prescribe these values or a vision of the good you need to live by. Um, and then there has to be some degree of coherence in in the worldview. Um, if you just have a lot of claims about uh, values, but they don't cohere with each other, then um, that sort of counts against there being a philosophical worldview. Um, but then it's not just uh, sort of stating that you agree with a certain way of looking at things. The second condition is that your practices in life have to be structured by the worldview to, to some extent. Um, so um, if I say I'm convinced that the, the overall goal should be minimizing suffering, including animal suffering, but I'm unwilling to take any actions um, for that, then uh, I don't really count as a practitioner of the anti-suffering worldview. Um, and similarly, like you could you could be a nominal adherent to um, see this with many religions, but also many worldviews. Well, maybe Stoicism sounds cool, but uh, I, when you look at how I handle my emotions and decisions, I'm I'm not actually very stoic. Um, now, what we try to do in the paper, though, is not require perfection in order to count as having your practices and life structured by this worldview. So we don't want to say only the Stoic sage or only the Christian saint or only the entirely effective altruist are, are in fact, uh, practicing the worldview. Um, so to explain it in the case of progressors, we use this analogy with health, where um, it's useful, health and fitness. It's useful both to think about the level of fitness you're at. So, you know, how many push ups can I do uh, right now? How quickly can I run or how strong is my arm grip? Um, and there, you know, some people are going to be, uh, there's going to be big, big differences between people. But as well as the absolute level, one thing that's really important for structuring is the direction. So if I still have a, a weak grip and uh, trouble with push-ups, but you know I'm uh, my strength has improved 100% over the last six months, um, that's that's a sign um, that I really am becoming fitter and healthier, even if my absolute level isn't very good. So, so we think that can be helpful for progressors to say, e even if they haven't gotten to a very high level, um, if they're going in the right direction, that might be enough for meeting question two. Though, um, condition two, sorry. Though that's a question for discussion is, well, is there a, a threshold you need to get to? Uh, how loose do we wanna be? Um, and we're still thinking uh, that through. And we're also a little wary of giving uh, one definitive answer sort of for any philosophical way of life. This is something that partly depends on what kind of requirements the tradition in question, the vision of the good in question places on its uh, adherence. So, so in some cases, the view itself might allow for um, a fairly minimal threshold, whereas others, um, someone like the Stoics might say, well, we're really all fools other than the sage. Um, now, those first two conditions uh, will be satisfied by sort of any reasonably comprehensive way of life. But, but we do wanna say there's there's gotta be something philosophical about this to be living philosophically, living a philosophical way of life. And that's what we try to get at with condition three, the idea that um, central practices and your overall way of life is uh, truth directed. And we decided to go with truth directed over um, sort of directed by reason um, to, have a wider range of activities that can count as truth directed and not rely just on pure reason. So, so truth directed practices definitely include uh, use, using reason. Um, but we also mentioned it, it could be that experiencing beauty and reflecting on it could um, 
help transform your life and bring you closer to the truth. Um, it could be that certain affective experiences, even if they don't change your your belief so much, they kind of str uh, experiencing, say, the the love of your your family or experiencing a connection with uh, with someone you're engaged in a project with would deepens your commitment to your values, uh, even if it doesn't change your sort of epistemology and, and credences. And that could be value, valuable in giving more motivational oomph, as, as, as Stephen put it earlier. So practices can be truth directed, either by helping you to recognize truths directly or indirectly, or by motivating you to really commit to those truths. Um, so we think those three questions will, if, if you satisfy those three conditions, you've got this um, overall vision of the good that you're committed to, and it really structures your life. It makes a difference to how you live and the practices you engage in based on that vision of the good uh, get you to the truth. Uh, at least conditional on your worldview being right. And we do say you can't just and blindly follow them. There has to be some kind of responsiveness to reasons, but we don't necessarily require you to be fully articulate and be, be able to demonstrate everything about your commitment. So again, we're looking for there to be some requirements, but but lower than, than, than say um, this idea that you've got to defend it all in terms of, of reason. So that's our pass at least at what these conditions are, though, as you can see, there's still still a question. Well, even if you accept these conditions, what kind of threshold do you need to meet on, on each of them? All right, uh, man, that's a lot to chew on, a lot to think about. Uh, I'm gonna kick off the discussion, if you don't mind, uh, by asking a question, I think, it's related to the one you posed, Stephen, um, and it, it, it just became sort of even more pressing as you were talking, Caleb. My question is, um, on your view, for like a philosophy as a way of life, where does the worldview come from? Where does the vision of the good come from? Um, and I guess why I think this is really important is I could see somebody, maybe an intellectualist like Cooper, uh, uh, objecting to your picture by saying, well, look, on your view, philosophy isn't a way of life. Living philosophically might be a thing, but really philosophy is a supplement to whatever way of life you're already inhabiting, whether it's Confucianism, Catholicism, CrossFitism, whatever it is, right? You have your thing and then philosophy can infuse your life. You can be more or less philosophical, but it's not philosophy as a way of life. You know, this person might say like, no, no, no. The core is that, you know, the belief that philosophy is self-sufficient in establishing sort of the view of the good that, that you sort of then structures your life in the way you guys have described. I don't know, thoughts on that? Uh, so is the, th is the question, Paul, that, that it's, um, it's now misleading or a misnomer to call this whole thing philosophy as a way of life on this project because it's philosophy is one tool in the toolkit or something like that, but there are but uh, there's a lot more going on. Is that the worry? I guess the worry is um, if I'm like a really hardcore intellectualist, I want to say, no, no, F like philosophy is a way of life. We should reserve this term. And I, like, I don't want it to be a semantic point, but just, yeah. you know, we, we should think of philosophy as a way of life as, uh, you know, the commitment to thinking that reason alone is capable of establishing a vision of the good. Even maybe if you start someplace and then you have to kind of work your way, I don't know. It's this belief that like, each individual can reason their way to a vision of the good that structures their lives in a way you've described. Whereas, uh, so that, that might be the vision that they want to defend. Whereas it seems like what you're describing depends on or presupposes having a vision of the good and then engaging philosophically with that vision of the good. Mm. Um, there it seems like, well, okay, so, so it's not philosophy as a way of life. It's like philosophy as a supplement to a way of life, which is okay. And that is some people's view, but I don't know. Yeah, I, thanks. Great, great question. Uh, Caleb, I have a couple thoughts, then you could chime in. So, um, so a, a, I'm skeptical about that project uh, of reason, as it were, giving you the, that, uh, that hierarchy of goods. But even if I'm optimistic about it, even if, let's say, I think that uh, you, we could 
it's very plausible maybe that virtue is the only thing that's intrinsically unconditionally valuable there are some pretty compelling arguments for that maybe it can't be taken away from you maybe you think that's like very important part of the good life uh, even though if you think that reason has this discerning power and, and could identify maybe a few goods maybe the most fundamental good I'm skeptical about that, but I'm wholly skeptical about the motivational power. So even if uh, even if reason could uh, pick out a few things as like most important virtues, say, I just think our psychologies are. I, so I, I deny that you know the intellectualist view that that would be sufficient to get you to do things. From from most of us, there might be a few rare creatures among us where that would work, but I'm, I'm skeptical. Caleb? So, yeah, I, I guess one thing that I think uh, the European J Journal of Philosophy paper tries to do is sort of push the burden of proof back in the other direction by saying, well, say the source uh, that you're appealing to in your vision of the good, some of those sources are tradition or perception or seeing um, someone with certain values as exemplary and then adopting those values. Then the question is, well, is using those sources uh, unjustified or irrational or, or can it turn out? M maybe the philosophy part comes in later to justify and defend um, the vision of the good. But then you might think if it ends up vindicated um, by, by that, then you shouldn't rule it out. Like it would be surprising. So take the Epicureans who are, you know, definitely seen as uh, clearly a philosophical way what way of life um but they have this whole theory about or, or, or these arguments for why we take, should take sense perception to be authoritative and we can't rely on reason um so the position they end up in is like one that they have arguments for but it's one on which you should go with your sense perception and that should make you see that the absence of pain is the highest good um and so it doesn't seem to me like you can say, oh, that's not philosophical because really they're saying you should rely on perception when actually like most of the philosophy is, is coming in there. So um, that's pushing back on that. I guess the other thing I'd say that I think your question brings up is that there is an interesting question about, say you've got someone living a Confucian way of life or a Christian way of life or a, an Epicurean way of life. Uh, are there going to be some people who are living those ways of life, but not philosophically and others who are say the ones, the Epicureans who can give you the arguments or defend their views better. Um, that that's something we're interested in, whether whether uh, sort of any of these traditions or living out ways of the good will involve meeting these conditions or whether only some more reflective practitioners might might meet them. I'm also very curious about the potential role philosophy might have in deciding between the worldviews, uh, and if you guys have views on that, because it seems clear that some of them, uh, and maybe many of them, maybe to count as a way of life, in fact, they have to be sort of incompatible with each other because they're structured by the certain vision of the good. So one question then is, yeah, what is the proper role of philosophy? Um, and, you know, one way of thinking about it is like, well, it's it's to give you the best one or to give you the one that's outside of all the other traditions or that, you know, gets away as far as possible from the distorting cultural factors or religious factors or whatever else. Um, so I, I'm very curious about your, your thoughts on phil philosophy's uh, limits or ability to help us sort through them, decide between them, change between them. Um, yeah, thanks, Paul. Good question. So I would say so I, I was earlier expressing, expressing skepticism about reason's discerning power, but there's a lot of stuff reason's good at, like uh, showing like what falls from what, showing you know what things are incompatible. Uh, and philosophers are really good at discerning, I think, like far down the road, this view, if you accept it, you're gonna be committed to something else. And um, if, if it, if there's just some deep uh, uh, 
something deeply unattractive about that something else that philosophy has just told you that this view is going to lead you there. So that that's an important role I think philosophy could do. It's, it's kind of philosophy with, just with a small p, but that's not trivial. Caleb? Uh, yeah, that's Caleb. Yeah, I mean, I think there's sort of the, in my view, there's the easier part where the discerning power definitely does seem to be there. And then these trickier questions. So um, why Aristotle sort of brings up the life of someone aiming at wealth uh, very contemptuously. I mean, partly that's the aristocratic Athen Athenian or ancient Greek stuff. But, but, but also I think it's just philosophical, like the idea that the good in life could be wealth um, just falls apart on a little examination. So, so I think there are cases where things that people are deeply attracted to like wealth and status, it's not very hard to see how unstable and unfulfilling they are. And so you can rule out some visions of the good. Now, in other cases, um, it turns out like how much should I value um, my character and achieving the overall good for for my myself is the goal my happiness or is the goal enlightenment you know it might depend on very hard questions about whether there's a persisting self and there are these very powerful Buddhist arguments and then uh, against the persisting self, but then there are powerful arguments in a lot of uh, other traditions from from ancient Greeks, Janus and and so on for, for, for a persisting self. And there it gets tricky, uh, but you can see, well, that it is a philosophical question and that whichever way you come down on it, that will then um, have all, all these downstream implications. So as Stephen was saying, you, you can at least see what the consequences are of those commitments and then get some idea of uh, what the case is for one view over the other. Now, whether it can get you all the way there to, to which one, um, I think that, that's, that's something we're not, well, we're, we're uh, still trying to figure out. Sure. Uh, so the comment section is on fire. Oh, Stephen, did you want to did you want to uh, say something quickly? Uh, it is. Um, I'm, can you hear me? Can hear you. Yep. You're. Yep. I mean, uh, just so we're kind of going in and out of ancient philosophy a bit. I'm reminded. You know, sometimes I, I teach the Gorgias, and when uh, Socrates is is uh, you know debating with Callicles or Polus, uh, it's when when the decisive moment in the argument what isn't when uh, reason, you know, gets uh, Polis in some iron grip. It's when he's so ashamed to like accept a position. So he said, if this follows, then like the life of scratching yourself all day is the best life. And then Calcus is like, oh, that's bad. <laughs> you know, that wasn't his reason telling him, oh, that's bad. It was just embarrassing. It was shameful. So I think that, um, so again, there's some vision of the good we have, but I think shame and emotions like that, emotions of admiration and so on, play a deeply important part and that reason can't do the whole thing. I have a huge question that I'm, I'm gonna, so my question is this, this, this uh, sort of visual metaphor that's running throughout a lot of the papers and this idea of philosophy getting you to see things uh, and this being characterized as not like a reason-based uh, sort of Process. I'm going to come back to that though, because like I said, the comments are on fire. We gotta, we gotta get to some of these comments here. Where do you uh, see the comments, Paul? Are they showing up for you? They're yeah. So there's comments. If you click on the video, you, it'll pop up. You'll see comments. You can do it either below. I'll just trust you. I'll trust you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so let me just. Um, there's a an interesting exchange here. Um, so it would follow. It seems to follow from your view that a philosopher of science or math uh, or biology. Who doesn't engage in philosophy as a way of, uh, or sorry, does not engage as philosophy as a way of life as they think or write about problems that arise specifically in their, I guess, subdiscipline or discipline. Um, so, for example, the philosopher of math, whether numbers are real, but that seems really restrictive. Like, come on, that's philosophy, and and can't that count as philosophy as a way of life? Doesn't seem like it on your view. Thoughts? Yeah, good question. Caleb, do you have thoughts? Because that may be like more in the ballpark of does this count as a philosophical way of life? Yeah, so there, I think it, 
it depends on what goes back to the vision of the good. So I think, you know, for someone like Aristotle, clearly you're living philosophically because you're, you're contemplating um, these realities, tr truths about quantities. Um, but then you have some people like the, the Epicureans where there is a physics, but it's just there for the sake of ethics. And so if you're pursuing, if you're pursuing philosophy of science so that we can uh, not fear death or the gods, then you're like living philosophically. But if you're just interested in figuring out these phenomena for their own sake or, or figuring out things um, about numbers for their own sake without any ethical import, then, um, well, the Epicureans think you're misusing reason and you're not really, really living. So, so I think that goes back to this question of what's included in the good life and any view of the good life in which it par partly consists in uh, n knowing um, truths and not, not purely instrumentally, I think can then fit in those cases. But, but there are views of the good life that, that don't accommodate those as, as part of, of what's good. So the, the question was uh, from Chrisula uh, and Bin Song, I think, uh, sort of had a comment that, that hopefully follows up on, on what you're saying, Caleb. Um, his, his thought is Aristotle says contemplation is the best life. So look, if you're a philosopher of math, I guess it really depends like the mode in which you're doing philosophy. But certainly um, if, if I'm understanding you correctly, Caleb, you know, I read philosophers of math or high level mathematicians. They're describing a mental state that I've never been in with respect to math, certainly, but that seems like almost a kind of a mystical sort of appreciation or contemplation. So I suppose part of it then on your view just depends on whether this is uh, uh, plugged in in the right sort of way to a vision of the good or whether it's just like, you know, I guess you can do any sort of philosophy like logic chopping or epistemology or even ethics like in a non-philosophical way or a non-living right way. yeah because on our view we emphasize the adverbial construction for a reason so because i think yeah even on aristotle's views and other just because you're engaging in the sort of activity that could contribute to a good life that doesn't mean that the way you're doing it um is so you could get into i mean i don't, I don't know that many philosophers of mathematics who are who are in it for the fame and glory but you know you 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 could be, um, or you, or that could be what, maybe you had a love for mathematics and truth to begin with, but then you get soured by bad experiences and uh, the uh, politics of the academic community or whatever. And, and, and then it really does transform the activity so that it's not so truth seeking um, and does become more uh, competitive or has these aspects that, that sort of degrade, degrade something that, that that could be good because we, we don't want to say that just because the type you know just because i'm engaged in uh, uh just because i'm talking to my family like that means i'm doing a good job like i i could be um doing a horrible parenting could be really good for the good life but i'm doing such a bad job at it it's making my life worse mm -hmm. um so the type of activity on its own isn't going to be determinative the way you're doing it um at least on most of the visions of the good and probably the ones we're, we're attracted to. Oh, oh, go ahead, Steven, you have something? Oh, sorry. Uh, I got it. Um, yeah, there, there's gotta be, so I distinguished at the beginning between philosophy as an academic discipline versus a way of life. So there are, there are characteristic uh, methods and problems and puzzles and way we think about things conceptually that, um, anybody who's listening to this probably is doing, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, any philosopher of science or philosopher of mathematics would be doing this. But um, to think about it in, in, a, in a way that it would structure your life, uh, I don't, I think very few of them would take themselves to be doing that. Now, it could be that amongst the goods that they take to be really valuable, very high up on the list is like, abstract contemplation or like thinking about the deep conceptual foundations of mathematics or like very that could be like the glory of being human that we could ask these very abstract questions um it doesn't have the structuring way of life aspect i guess so um so they would be philosophical would they be living philosophically 
yeah, kind of, I guess. So this, I mean, this, I think raises a really interesting question, uh, which is like, are there any sub-disciplines or approaches to philosophy that are themselves like way of life philosophies? Uh, you mentioned sort of indirectly existentialism as having the structure of a way of life that's philosophically infused. Um, and then I started thinking about others, you know, consequentialism. Nowadays, a lot of people try to make consequentialism certainly a way of life or certain effective altruism or, you know, certain branches of it. Um, and then certainly there are religious examples of this. But OK, so question. Obviously, we don't want to say any tradition, branch, subdiscipline could be like this. Um, but then I just wonder, OK, what about the weird in between cases? Can analytic contemporary analytic philosophy be a way of life? Yeah, I wonder, going back to no. Stephen's initial <laughs> comments, uh, how much the hierarchy is important. Because, you know, obviously, as an academic, most academics, you know, tend to be quite committed to whatever they're doing, and at least implicitly think it has a lot of value. Um, so that gets you, you know, some way towards having, you think this thing is good, you think it's worth devoting much of your life to. But I guess it seems to me that you probably at least need that next further step about, well, does this mean I should absolutely maximize my time spent thinking about these things? Or what kind of role do relationships have? Do I, do I need to take, uh, take uh, day, days off? Or, um, you know, how, how does this, my social political context relate to my work? That if, if all you're saying is that this particular academic activity is good, but you don't have any guidance about how good it is compared to other things, which other things to prioritize relative to it, then I just don't think you're there yet. You don't have the whole right. sort of picture. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think it might, I mean, if uh, if it's not just uh, cleverness or, or uh, vanity, um, then I think, you know, you could make contemporary analytic philosophy could you could admire it because of its like transparency or or it's uh striving to transparency like i i'm not trying to manipulate you i'm trying to be very clear about what my premises are you know as clear as i can possibly be there's something like uh nobly almost democratic about that anyway but that's like infusing uh values like a transparency of of uh trying to treat people's intelligence you know take it seriously um, it could be a way of it could be a way of life maybe who knows yeah i'm not so going to put that one in the series though no <laughs> and, well, and i think partly we, we did want to concede something to critics to like these are ethicists ethical uh you know s studies that that the way the academic way we set up to do philosophy um is conducive to certain kinds of research, but but maybe isn't really set up for uh, you know fulfilling the uh, the kind of conditions we think are necessary, and that's partly why uh, there is this disconnect. Or you know people are looking for someone like uh, Socrates or an Epictetus, or you know that 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 would be the ideal of the philosopher, but that's definitely not what we're we're set up to uh, to produce in contemporary analytic philosophy. Okay, so I'm uh, going to get to another comment really quickly, but here's a quick test that came up with as you guys were uh, uh, speaking. I asked myself, can I think of a life story uh, in which the main character sort of philosophically structures their life uh, and is pursuing some sort of way of life? And I think like Sartre, sure, or Sartre, or whatever, okay. Um, you know, I think, um, oh gosh, you know, Anscombe, okay. Uh, and, and these are sort of helping me pick out like virtue ethics. Yeah, consequentialism, Peter Singer, sure. I'm thinking of sort of uh, uh, life stories that are philosophically inflected and structured in this particular way. Uh, I guess I'd go to like Wittgenstein or Bertrand Russell, but there you're like diving into a very particular historical period with a tradition. And, uh, and then maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm just like in the thick of it now. And so it's harder to extrapolate like what a analytic life story looks like. Certainly, there are people that do live like that, uh, and in praiseworthy, in apparently praiseworthy ways. Um, 
Yeah, anyway. I, I never knew David Lewis, but from what I hear, he might have been an example of someone like I, just the ideas or just. But you're looking for, like I was thinking of Wittgenstein too when you started saying that, Paul. And is the idea supposed to be someone who's just extremely uh, consistent and like pure-minded about what their commitments? If you accept this, these are the consequences, and uh, I'm going to take them in very unexpected places sometimes. It's sort of like the life story itself uh, uh, has the value structure that it sort of ma that it makes manifest the value structure uh, that the vision of the good sort of does uh, in your picture. And it's philosophically inflected in some obvious way. That's what I was thinking. And I was thinking of Parfit actually as maybe David Lewis, maybe Parfit uh, is like this. I don't know. Um, it also, I don't know, for me, it's a really helpful heuristic about you know, whether, like when I'm evaluating whether I think a particular philosophically inflected way of life is good or bad. Uh, I think of the people and then I think like, eh, or like, yeah. Um, okay, sorry, a viewer comment, viewer question. They say, okay, thanks, this is very helpful. Uh, this is Crystal. Uh, how do you respond to students who ask, why live philosophically? And I feel like this is a great question because it's almost a trick question. Uh, <laughs> but how do you respond or how would you respond from the perspective of the paper to a student that just came up to you after class and asked you that? Um, Caleb, I have a thought, and then you want to jump in. So really in our two papers, we say, in the European Journal paper, we say something kind of general, more general about the value of this. And then in, in the Metaphilosophy paper, something more specific maybe. In the European Journal, we talk about the value of living philosophically. We tie it to, uh, to authenticity. So you might have inherited your vision of the good uh, from your culture, whatever that might be, from your tradition. And it might actually have things kind of roughly lined up right. Like maybe it says that all human beings are equal in dignity as a fundamental idea. And maybe all human beings are equal in dignity. Um, so living philosophically though, you don't, uh, there is something that we do when we we can take a step back, we can abstract from our commitments, what we've inherited, and we can ask this, this characteristic question, like, why should we think that? You know, is it true? And we might like not bottom out in some rational insight, but just compelling people in our life, people we find attractive. Um, but unless you can ask that, like, why think that? Uh, why is it true? There's um, there's a kind of like uh, immaturity or inauthenticity or something about our life. And there's a dignity, I think, in being able to reflect on even what we've been given and either to deny it or to affirm it. So I would make the pitch in terms of authenticity. At the end of that, we also talk about, there's like this childlike wonder, always asking like, what. You know, what are the other alternatives here uh, that's, I think, characteristic of philosophy? Um, but, Caleb, we're, we get into more of the details in metaphilosophy. So what would you say about that? Yeah, and there I'd say it's sort of, I think both papers are sort of written for a philosophical audience who maybe has too high a view of capital R reason. But, you know, we're happy to defend reason, especially to... Uh, uh, undergraduates. So, so, so there, I mean, I think the way I'd put it is when we look at the first two conditions, you know, you're going to have at least an implicit ranking of goods and some kind of worldview you've inherited from somewhere. And that uh, one way or another, you, you are living your life in, uh, in accordance with, with certain values. So then the question is, well, have you examined them as, as, as Stephen was saying to really authentically accept or reject them, you you do need to do that re reflection using reason, not you only using reason, but reason is a very useful tool, uh, as, especially when it comes to some of the things that are maybe mo more obviously uh, mistaken values that that we're tempted to hold. One thing that's okay. interesting. Oh, sorry, did you have more, Stephen? No, I was just uh, your earlier examples of like of money and uh, well, wealth and honor. It's just, I mean, reason is pretty effective at, they just fall down, they collapse so quickly, but you know, and implicitly 
a lot of people might walk into the classroom with those as deep goods. Um, so yeah, it, it, I don't know if that's authenticity or just, you know, seeing weak, uh, you know, exposing weak, uh, weak visions. It can have that role too. Sorry, Paul, I interrupted you. Oh, no, no. Um, so one thing that's interesting to me is, so it's certainly available from the point of view of the paper and the you know, position you're defending to offer some sort of pitch or argument to the student. It seems like there's another route that's available to you, which would be to help them get to see what's good about living philosophically. Um, and there it seems like, uh, just kind of brainstorming here, but like, you know, it seems like that's kind of the platonic approach like plato like you know socrates somebody comes to them they're kind of skeptical right like walks up after class and like why should i even care about philosophy it's like well you know oh let's just set that aside for a second you know what, what do you enjoy doing and they're like oh i love money and he's like okay and then he like tricks them right and sort of goes through this exchange and he's like well i just made you look like a total fool you know wouldn't it be nice if you could do that and uh let me tell you a story about the cave you know whatever else that like that shows you that, that the trickery is not the cool part of the thing that I'm doing. So I can kind of trick you and I can sort of make you feel different ways or motivate you in different ways or really make you uncomfortable about your commitments. But let me tell you a story. I mean, so so it's interesting to me that, that a position available to you would be just to kind of back up and say, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to argue <laughs> with you right now. Just like kind of hold on. Let me tell you this story or look at these figures or observe the way that your life might go if you're characteristically committed to a vision of the good on which truth plays a huge role versus not um that might have sort of the affective element that you that, that you've really been emphasizing in uh in sort of evaluating a way of life um i think that would be so when you talk about a story do you mean like the allegory of the cave or stories like that or other kinds of stories this gets back to the thing you pitched out right at the beginning, Stephen, about sort of how we approach these questions in class. When I talk about truth and the importance of truth in my class, I uh, actually bring an audio recording that I did, an interview with a guy who um, meticulously fact checks truthers online. So it's kind of, it's really sad, but um, yeah, of course there are all these people on Reddit and whatever that are uh, always denying that Sandy Hook ever happened. This guy is like for seven years made his entire life's work writing blog posts that fact checks every single one of these theories and like just a really insanely meticulous way. And he's an OIT guy, so he can get all the photos and like the directory and the, you know, so he can really fact check it. And so what I do is I contrast this guy with uh, uh, Edward Fetzer, the guy who just got sued successfully for libel for uh, being a truther. And I just like, I put them both on this sort of up on the screen and, and you know, I give a little bit of air time to, to Fetzer's kind of like worldview. But then I play the audio from this interview that I did with this guy who's committed to the truth. And then we put it in the context of this really massive, horrible national tragedy. And we just ask like, if we don't care about the difference between truth and bullshit, like in the technical sense, because we introduced this, then we can't really say that what this guy is doing is good and what this guy is doing is bad. Even though they're both doing the same thing, they're meticulously arguing about the empirical facts of this one thing online. And so, again, the, I just tell that as the overarching story for the day. Um, that's that's what I have in mind when I talk about a story, I guess. And again, it, it hits them in the gut in a kind of way that that for me at least, I'm not capable of hitting people in the gut with an argument. Uh, uh, yeah. So I don't know, but it's also very manipulative. Um, but I hope in a good way, because <laughs> I'm motivated by truth. <laughs> well, and I, th I think that's why it's Im why I mean, so many of us teach uh, Plato's Apology, uh, because it's not just seeing what Socrates can do in dialectical exchanges, but it's seeing what he actually says when his life is, is literally on the line. Um, and why, you know, you mentioned someone like Enscombe, I think you, you could take her more, people could take her views more seriously when you see, well, she was willing to take this very unpopular position and think that Harry Truman um, was a war criminal and did, should not be invited to this, uh, to Oxford, e even though um, that really caused all, all these problems. So seeing this kind of commitment to the truth, whereas I think what undermines us is, you know, if uh, there are all these philosophy professors who 
are trying to get to the truth and have all these radical views. But then if it looks like our lives are just like identical to people of similar socioeconomic background and education and uh, like w philosophy isn't making any difference to how uh, how we're living then then that sort of it, 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 you can have uh, if, if you have enough bad examples that uh, pushes people away as well as the examples of of of, of sticking um, to truth well this I think actually, illuminates in a really helpful and interesting way one of Anscombe's own ideas, which she took from Aquinas, which is that there's ways of living the truth uh, and there's ways uh, of just merely appreciating it intellectually. But her thought is, yeah, if you are living in the world in a certain way structured by the values you've appreciated with reason, et cetera, et cetera, uh, then you're living the truth, you're doing the truth. It's this weird sort of like action theory-ish kind of distinction. But it really reminded me of your distinction between self-initiated and self-directed ways of getting yourself to appreciate the good or, or act in accordance with your vision of the good. Um, because it's, and, and it connects up with the authenticity uh, value as well, I think, in that, um, yeah, yeah, you can, in a way, like what sort of evidence is it against, you know, an effective altruist's position if they walk out of the lecture hall and get an Alexis? Like, you can't say like, aha, that's like the premise, you know? But in a way, it totally undermines it, like in a deeply philosophical way. Um, that's that's weird and interesting, um, and and yeah, in a, in, in a way that yeah, the the paper anyway. Sorry, just really provoked this response uh, in me at least. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's the part of the paper where we put in like a subtle plug for psychedelics, right? <laughs> 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 sorry, <laughs> or, yeah. Sorry, it's a but private how, Facebook community. So. <laughs> yeah, uh, but how were you thinking of it, Paul? The a quiet between the self-initiated and the self-directed. Yeah, so I guess what I was thinking um, was there's like a- How would the effect of altruist, how would that plug into the effect of altruist who goes in, into the Rolls Royce or whatever? Yeah, so, so um, there's a certain sort of integrity that a philosopher has in living out their philosophical commitments because it is a manifestation of their vision of the good. And they're clearly sort of living philosophically insofar as they're manifesting that vision of the good, not just like intellectually and in argumentation, but like in the world. Um, and so one one interesting thought is just another sort of mark against, I think, the intellectualist uh, uh, that you guys raised in the beginning is um, there seems to be something philosophically wrong in the case where the effective altruist walks out and gets in their Lexus and, and has no care at all for the sort of economic position they're in in the world, yep. um, at least if, you know, maybe they're anyway. So just in the in the version of the case I'm imagining. Um, and so, so, so then you start asking, okay, well, what's wrong? And it seems like this distinction between self-initiation or self-manipulation and self-directedness is going to be really crucial because the integrity of their action, the way it connects up to their vision of the good, uh, that's going to be sort of a, a, a manifestation of agency. Sorry. Uh, no, I think that's phrase, right. but... Yeah. I mean, the self, self, uh, initiated versus, uh, so that's when like you pop a pill and it, ch it changes radically things about you, but that's a weird thing to call a spiritual exercise versus self uh, directed or something would be when you, you might have some practice like walking that could in fact have transformative uh, influence on your desires or your vision. Um, I agree. I mean, a, a, the, a, a fully philosophical life would have to be just not self would have to be self-directed so everything tries to be informed by that vision um i mean as caleb said that's like perfection maybe you know that we fall short of and we could just like we could still count as being musical when we miss quite a few notes maybe um we could still count maybe as as trying to direct ourselves by this vision even when we fall short i think but it's interesting that falling short can be a philosophical failure. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I think but it, it does get to a possible tension over which which views, um, which sorts of approaches to the good w were, were sympathetic to. Because I think uh, some versions of consequentialism are a tricky case. Because the more you have a philosophy that 
uh, versions where intentions don't really play a key role. So most of the views we've talked about are ones where they are vital, but if you're a certain kind of consequentialist or you're just into um, maximally satisfying preferences, and then it doesn't really matter whether the people who are acting um, necessarily are, are thinking about or reflectively aware of consequences or satisfying preferences. Um, maybe if they just do that really well, then they're living out that way of life, but in a non-reflective, and it's not even important for reflection on this vision of the good. So there could be visions of the good that really don't have much space for, or don't, don't have any positive requirements, uh, non-instrumental requirements for reflection and awareness and self-direction. And then I'm... You, you could try to build, allow for that, but I think I'm a little more inclined to say, well, well, they're not really advocating a f philosophical way of life. Maybe there are philosophical arguments for consequentialism or for adopting preference satisfaction as your, the overall goal society should be aiming at or something. But if we actually develop that view, um, what we're advocating for isn't something that could be called living philosophically, even if it's the outcome of a, of a philosophy. I think that's really interesting, Caleb. one thing that's interesting is the way in which what you're saying now, Caleb, really parallels, I think, Bernard Williams's critiques of consequentialism uh, as uh, essentially like disintegrating for the individual uh, and as sort of selfless in this really deep and, and meaningful way. And so and there, too, you know, Williams often, but in this case, especially, I think. Uh, is giving us cases that aren't really fundamentally sort of supposed to play this analytic sort of logical philosophical role of proving uh, or disproving like this one particular claim. He's trying to show us, he's trying to give us a story where he's like, consider the person that objectifies themselves and takes a job at a nuclear weapons facility to gum up the works and consider how sad that is. And then he's like, you, do you want that? And he's not saying, you know, consequentialism can't handle it or respond to it or isn't consistent because of it. He's sort of just like presenting it and then walking away from it, which is, is just really interesting. Um, and again, it, it connects directly up with this value of auto uh, uh, authenticity uh, 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 that plays, I think, a pretty big role in the background, at least for your view. Let me, so let me do other comments and questions from the audience, uh, especially in case your battery is running uh, at all low, Stephen. Um, so one question we have from Jeremy is, says, I agree that reasons responsive, uh, that being reasons responsive is necessary for living philosophically and that being truth directed is too. But I wonder what you think about the other major values alongside truth, namely goodness and beauty uh, and what role those can or should play uh, in uh, living philosophically. I added that last sentence, by the way, as kind of a submission, but do you have thoughts on the role of truth and beauty or sorry, goodness and beauty? So, uh, yeah, I can start. So, yeah, I think what we say in that section of the paper maybe does seem to Im implicitly uh, commit us to a kind of transcendental view on which there, 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 there is some sort of transcendental unity between uh, oh. goodness and beauty and truth. So that, I mean, we, we mentioned... Um, Irish, I think Iris Murdoch and Simone Vile and some other views on 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 which uh, having this experience of beauty can then be uh, morally transformative and get you closer to the truth. Um, but th that's it's it's not clear that on all, all views of reality that that would be the case. You know, there some people think the truth is horrible. So so I think on the at least on the view I'm inclined to those things are going to go together but i think if if they don't uh then then you do have this kind of tension um i'd be more inclined say they don't i would be more inclined to think that in a world where beauty and truth are opposed the more philosophical person is the one who recognizes the horrible truth over living with the 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 beautiful fantasy uh so I guess it, if I had to choose that, that's maybe partly why we we picked truth, and and because re reason has more of a role in discerning truth than it does uh, with respect to to beauty, at least 
I'd be inclined to think. But yeah, what do you think, Stephen? Yeah, uh, thanks, Jeremy. That was an interesting question. I, I do think we were implicitly assuming that they're going to be tied together, uh, truth, goodness, and beauty. Uh, and I guess the question is, is asking, right, if they come apart, which way would the philosopher go? And if a philosopher pursued beauty, uh, or if a person pursued beauty at the expense of truth, would that person still be philosophical? Or maybe that's like an interest, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I think, you know, if that were possible, which I'm not sure, I think the philosopher would be the one who goes for truth and recognizes, uh, yeah, recognizes the, the downsides of that. I, I have a hard time imagining going for truth would not promote goodness but or beauty, but it might. Yeah, there you have, I mean, you have like, the infamous case of Plato's noble lie or something like that. So I think what's striking there is even in those kind of cases where you might be trying to promote goodness or morality at the expense of truth, it's not generally for one for oneself that one's doing that. Instead, it's uh, uh, for, you know, the, the guardians are doing that so that the rest of society will be better, better ordered. So especially if we're thinking of the individual living philosophically, it's, it's, it's hard to see how for me, uh, giving up truth could help me become better, even if I thought that could be true for, um, for others and my efforts to make them better. To follow up too, this is super helpful, to follow up too, uh, here's another piece of Jeremy's question. There are layers to it. It's another piece of it. Um, so he says, uh, to him, it seems like uh, goodness, truth, goodness, and beauty can, might correspond to different modes of knowing. So knowing that, knowing how, or knowing a person. Uh, and so maybe part of, the, part of the, the question here is not just if they come apart, what should the person living philosophically do, but is there a way of enriching the view that you all have, um, not by focusing on like an intellectualist sort of mode of reason and truth, but by broadening out the ways that we know, the modes of knowledge uh, to include more affective or more um, uh, uh, sort of know how we kinds of, of, of ways of knowing. So maybe, maybe it's, you know, maybe this can be like a friendly addition. Um, what, if we, what if we use knowledge instead of just intellect and reason to do some of the work of, of, of broadening out uh, philosophy as a way of life? Um, any any comments on that? Otherwise, uh... Uh, I I mean, so if you if you if the vision is accurate, you could be said to know it. Then um, it's going to have all sorts of practical implications. I we we think I think that will be tied to know how. Um, so um, so again, in the Notre Dame talk last year, we. We I floated the idea not just of the vision of the good, but also like the way. Um, so the way is going to, I think, be filled with know-how, like how to get from A to B. That's a thought. Yeah, I think this connects up too with a question about how how much we want to include under the umbrella of philosophy versus how much uh, even a philosophical way of life should delegate leave room for for other other things to take apart so so i take the point that there might be you know ways of knowing you get through the arts you get through poetry and music and so on that that are really important not just to a good life but to living philosophically um but then i'm not sure we want to include everything that helps you live philosophically under under sort of philosophy proper so um i don't know if it's I, I think it's not just terminological but rather the idea is there could be a lot about the arts or you know about fitness and nutrition science we maybe we want to have that as part of our good life um but it's not clear to me that we should say that when you're doing that you're doing philosophy we, when you're doing that you might be doing something that supports philosophy and living well um but there might be some kind of distinction. And then, yeah, that's something, I don't know if you have thoughts, Stephen, because that, that, that's certainly something I was curious about as well. 
how much do we want to bring all like the full panoply of supporting activities under philosophy um, or how much do we want to say they're part of the good life um, but some of them are our part in this sort of auxiliary way rather than being constitutive of philosophy or something yeah i'm not sure you want to say that you know you're doing philosophy when you but again if you may change it to the adverb like could you be engaging with art uh philosophically well at one level yeah of course there's a whole field of aesthetics but even like taking in a painting in a way where or a statue you know like it demands that you change your life um um that that would be the adverb might have some purchase there you'd be engaging with the statue or the poem philosophically where it, it reshuffles what you care about and it brings certain things to salience and others not if you could make sense of like in a, in a sort of first person point of view uh when you are living philosophically and when you aren't seems like it could sort of be a, a normative lens that touches every part of your life and just guides everything. So I'm at the gym and I'm thinking, am I living philosophically right now? No, I'm like, I'm not lifting enough. I'm not like, you know, being true to, you know, so I guess if we could make the living philosophically um, notion sort of concrete enough in experience, that might actually be a way of, of, of you know, structuring life and experience and action. But don't you think it always has like a guardrail role to play so that thing same thing you're doing at the gym we could say are you living virtuously now are you acting virtue or like no you know i'm just eating a salad what or i don't know maybe that's too virtuous if you're like <laughs> if you're doing something that doesn't seem courageous or anything it sounds weird to say that you're living virtuously when you're just going for a walk in oh, one yeah. way but not in another way Oh, I think I, I'm 100% on board, actually. I think I am living okay. philosophically when I'm at the gym, if I'm okay. doing it the right way. Uh, okay. I, I do think, I do think, I, I, you know, this is kind of how I conceptualize uh, my own experience. Like, are you integrated in the right sort of way? Yeah, I would say, yeah, maybe there's always going to be that guardrail and integrating uh, role in that, you know, I'm doing something because it's good in some way that's got to tie into the overall picture. I guess what seems to me crucial is that there is then a difference between sort of where the expertise or knowledge with respect to the activity is is coming. So, you know, when I'm deciding on my overall goals in life, their, their you know, philosophy is playing, going to play a central role in, in figuring that out and discerning. Um, when I'm deciding how many push-ups to do in my workout, uh, there, you know, it could be philosophically informed that I, I want, I have this this goal of a certain kind of fitness and I, I want to push myself, but not excessively. And here's the role that I think fitness should have in the good life. But then like how many push-ups does that equate to? Like philosophy can't take me all the way there. That's where I need to like read up on people with ex expertise in physiology and and, and so on. So, so in a lot of those cases, there's going to be the adverbial guardrail stuff from philosophy, but then a lot of the content and expertise is going to have to come from separate disciplines. And even there, though, I mean, you got to be living philosophically when you're looking at experts and deciding which ones to trust or doing the research. So yeah. it's like, I don't know, it's sort of a normative lens. It, it might touch everything. And OK, so this might be I'm going to try this transition it might be horrible, but OK, um, one thing that I'm struck by is you're talking about living philosophically uh, and using philosophy as a way of life um, to sort of evaluate the way in which a life manifests or doesn't a vision of the good is a commitment that we have in our teaching at GGL. So, so to bring it full circle to the question you started with, Stephen, and also a question that we got in the comments here. Um, so the, the person watching wants to hear more about how we make use of these ideas in the classroom or how you obviously how you guys make use of these ideas in the classroom. One commitment we have, though, is that students are in living are manifesting commitments in the way that you described earlier, like wealth is good, power is good, high powered career will make me happy, et cetera. In living, in making these practical choices, you're manifesting commitments, but you're also committing yourself, right? Uh, and one way of thinking about living philosophically is, 
okay, it's important that you have the philosophical infusion or layer in the activity of making those decisions, because otherwise you could go horribly wrong. And so, so one thought is, and this again, is just like a literal commitment in our pedagogy is we already think our students uh, are living philosophically, but maybe not consciously living philosophically. And to bring it to consciousness and to show them that philosophy gives them sort of access to uh, a reflective control or like a reflective way of organizing their life. Like that is one of the essential roles philosophy can play. So for us, you know, this helps explain why, you know, we don't make, why we make some of the more controversial pedagogical decisions we make, like not going in for a really comprehensive historical view or, you know, teaching certain kinds of skills. We're really interested in just taking the students' lives and saying, let's, let's like infuse that with philosophy because it's going to make you better. And that itself manifests a vision of the good uh, that's controversial, but we can do yeah. it before the Pope runs our university. Um, so, so, but so I'll pose the question then to you guys. So uh, is that a way in which philosophy as a way of life uh, affects your approach to teaching or are there other ways that, that it makes its way into to sort of the classroom for you? Can I start, Caleb? Mm -hmm. um, so just, yeah, I mean, autobiographically, I think that's right, Paul. So I, I do think about, so try to unearth people's implicit value commitments, see what their grounds are for doing that, for how, holding those commitments and see what can be said for them. But um, I'm just thinking, doing a little soul searching here. I was probably doing that when I began as a philosophy teacher before like P wall came on the scene. Like, I think people have probably been doing that for a while. I know they have. Uh, so, so this is again, soul searching for all of us. Like when we brand a course as P wall, what is it that's distinctive? Cause I think any ethics course would have been many would have been striving to unearth those commitments and maybe the best, way I can think about it is, again, these, uh, these, these three parts, like, it's not just this is the vision, but like, where are you starting from now? And what would be like, what are the disorders or that we're born with and that in society, personally, whatever, that we have to try to overcome selfishness or tribalism, or inauthenticity, whatever. I, I don't know, does that make sense? So it's thinking of it, I, so to be honest, I'm gonna be teaching P-Wall in the fall for the first time in four years. And uh, in the past I was, I had just put out like, here's stoicism, let's talk about it and see what we think it has going for it. Here's, you know, the Buddhist tradition, let's talk about it. But I haven't, I haven't really thought of it in a way, this structured three part way where we try to, where we try to think through it in those terms. Sorry, that was running on a bit. I, it's a question I ask myself, like what's distinctive about these courses? And uh, maybe Caleb has a better answer. Maybe you do, Paul. Well, to me, there's sort of two different types of uh, exercise or uh, philosophy as a way of life um, in the classroom, things you could be doing. One of them is more reflective on uh, practices and values the students already have. So, you know, trying to write out what are your, your goals um, or, or it can be in response to uh, something you're studying. So don't, don't necessarily start treating your friends completely differently, but start thinking through what if you did accept the Epicurean view and saw your friends as uh, pain relief instruments how, how would that change things? Think, think so, is, is, that how, is that how you already treat your friends? So no, so no change, or, or, or would that really reconfigure your relationship? So, so those are kind of dealing with the students' lives already, but maybe being a little more explicit in reflecting um, than, than the average ethics course. I mean, I think Stephen's right. This is, it's not like what we're, 
thinking about here is completely new. I think it's something that a lot of teachers already do and, and do, do well, but maybe, uh, yeah, building in more exercises that uh, sort of force the students to reflect at, uh, or or push them in that direction rather than just inviting them to hopefully apply what you talked about. But then the one that maybe goes further is where you actually um, have some practice that that students presumably aren't doing where where it is um, eating in a certain way for a few days or staying off social media for for a few days or um, uh, just just trying uh, something that one of these ways of life recommends as good. And then with that, at least brief sample and experience, then having a better idea of why they think it's good and whether you agree or not. Um, and that's not something that the ordinary ethics class asks. And there can be, uh, yeah, there's definite value there, though, though, though then it gets trickier how much to ask of students. Do they really get a sense for? Um, what's good about uh, careful reading or meditation or something if, if you if they're just doing this one time for five minutes. So um, yeah, raises a lot of questions too. Controversial proposal that I may regret, uh, come to regret eventually. Um, what if the distinction between a P-Wall class and regular philosophy class uh, is that a P-Wall course presents way of life philosophies like existentialism or effective altruism or presents philosophies in their most way of life form uh, and does it in, in a more experiential way so that students can kind of experience from the inside out what the way of life presupposed by that philosophy is uh, and then comes to appreciate kind of from like a traditional in per, uh, internal perspective maybe what their take on that philosophy is. So, Here's the part I'll regret. I hate. I don't like this analogy, but the same way that uh, positive positivity psychology courses presuppose a fairly comprehensive view of value in the human person, et cetera, uh, and stand in sharp contrast to just standard survey 101 psych courses that try to take a disciplinary kind of objective approach um, and might, for pedagogical reasons, say, okay, pretend you're uh, you know a CBT sort of practitioner. Here's how it works, but it's always at the service of understanding the concepts or something like that. The positivity psychology people, they just jump right in. They're like, nah, I don't know, we got it. This is it, do these things. Like actually, you know, go do these things. And again, it's not that it has to be manipulative. You could be trying to show people from the inside out what's wrong with this particular tradition or, you know, to really introduce them from the inside out uh, to a particular tradition to let them be in a place of more uh, uh, autonomy and, and, and freedom reflectively to choose what they want. Um, but I do think, I think that way of thinking about it, I think there's something to it. And, and there, I think, okay, last thought, sorry. There's a distinction then between different kinds of P wall courses. One where you structure the course as uh, an attempt to do that for many different traditions versus uh, one in which you just do that with respect to one tradition. In okay. GGL, the way I think about it, we're, we're, we're p-walling people into virtue ethics and out of virtue ethics if they want. But we say day one, Aristotle is the spirit animal of the course. And if you want to fight with him, that's fine. We're going to give you the resources. We'll talk about consequentialism and existentialism mainly. Those are the main ones that we think throughout the whole course about. Um, but th this is what it is to be in this course in the same way that when you sign up for Martin Seligman's class, it's like, you, you got to buy in, you know, uh, subjective well-being, increasing the baseline, these are goods. Now let's figure out how to do it, even if you can be critical at different points. But anyway. No, that's fascinating. So when you so you teach Nietzsche in your course, right? Yeah. So is Nietzsche just the foil? He's like, or or do you like say, let's give this guy the best run? Oh, yeah. Life? No, we always I mean, for any figure that we think like um, and, and again, it's it's not like virtue ethics. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> but, but certainly for any figure, I mean, that's that's what we're really trying to grapple with. One of, our, one of my commitments in teaching, I won't speak for Megan or anybody else, one of my commitments in teaching is um, you can really only charitably understand and appreciate uh, somebody's view if you're deeply engaged in that sort of back and forth, that discourse, and you're inhabiting it. Like, you can look at it objectively from like, you know, oh, here's what they thought, and here's what they thought, they're the claims. But like, to me, that's less charitable than saying, let's get like all the way sort of into the weeds and, and think and really engage. 
Nietzsche is a weird case because uh, at Notre Dame, we think he's a virtue ethicist. Uh, yeah, it's like a McIntyre that. thing. <laughs> uh, I can see that. But absolutely, I mean, certainly with Peter Singer, certainly with Benatar, certainly with the consequentialists, uh, our thought is like, let's take this all the way sort of to its conclusion and let's think, you know, what's the worst sort of commitment that we're stuck with? What's the worst commitment they're stuck with? And let's appreciate that in the first person perspective. I have to say, you know, that this suffering that I'm going through is ultimately valuable insofar as it shapes my character or it's meaningless or, you know, to we try to really, really get deep into that and then say like, does that ring true to experience? Like our, again, our, our sort of uh, catchphrase is the, the, you know, bring, bring it, bring all of this up against the facts in life. Uh, and uh, if it doesn't ring true, walk away from it. Uh, so I don't know. Um, what was that last phase? Bring it, bring all this up against what in life? Facts and life. I'm misquoting <laughs> Aristotle there. Oh, okay. Caleb knows it's one of my favorite hobbies is to make up Aristotle quotes. <laughs> but there's some. He says something about you know philosophers. You, you got to take philosoph philosophical theories and, and bring them up against the facts uh, of life or the facts of experience, and only then can you fully sort of uh, appreciate. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm butchering that, Caleb. Yeah. Well, there, there's a few different contrasts. He um, there's yeah the apparent phenomena sometimes he appeals to or yeah what's the case um but yeah but yeah i i think there there's something like that 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 the the well if the theory is for the sake of action then th then that that is the the measure more than the whether you have a coherent and sim simple theory though i mean I, I like that distinction paul and thinking there are these different types of courses i'm not sure i'd be willing to say that to be like a good philosophy as a way of life course it, it has to be heavily experiential um partly because i think one one good uh, beyond just the experiential that can come out of this is the emphasis on seeing uh, on, on something like a complete vision or or worldview or or the unity of uh, ethics, metaphysics, epistemology? So 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 I could see a good philosophy as a way of life course where um, you think oh like Stoics saying virtue is the only good or Epicureans saying it's all about pleasure and pain. These seem like rather extreme positions you know why wouldn't everyone go for a uh, moderate quasi aristotelian or, or or something but then when you dig in deep into the logic and physics and uh, so on you can see how it all fits together and is supportive and 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 i think there's something valuable in that so either maybe a more historical approach or or partly like getting pushing back against uh, a feature of how philosophy is sometimes done in the contemporary university where everything's so subdivided and specialized. And so you miss out on part, part of the appeal of philosophy was this idea that you could get an overall view of reality that would tell you what the cosmos is like and our place in it and then have these ethical implications and sort of looking at these these views as 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 wholes instead of uh you know just reading a bit of this the stoic view in ethics or whatever but but not engaging with them so that, that's that's another type of course that seems to me ha has its own value you're gonna have to create a taxonomy uh all the different modes of engaging philosophically and do it people courses <laughs> uh so last thing is just if, if either of you has any any last thoughts or any, anything uh else that you'd like to say or add uh to the conversation i'll give you the last word uh and then we've we've about reached our time so i'll i'll, I'll uh and wrap it up after that but any last thoughts anybody want the last word i'm good thank you for organizing this paul i really appreciate it yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Any anything else, Caleb? Yeah, well, th thanks so much. Um, no, I mean, I think I would just say, you know, we don't think these papers are uh, the final and definitive accounts of everything. And, and as was come out, there are all, the, all these outstanding questions. And hopefully we'll be able to discuss them more in person next summer with everyone who can make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a really exciting. Uh, I mean, people still talk about 
the sessions at the last uh, summer where where uh, we we're raising some of these theoretical issues with respect to philosophy as a way of life. I think this is an incredibly exciting sort of next step in that conversation, uh, and it's opening up so many issues in teaching in uh, you know uh, different sub subfields um, and just in the philosophy as a way of life community in general. Uh, that yeah, I think uh, on behalf of the community, I think I can say this. Uh, thanks for publishing these papers. They're very interesting, and it was really fun to engage with them. Uh, and thanks for for taking the time to do this today. I really appreciate it, especially under the circumstances, Stephen. Uh, yeah, the I hurricane. I'm really glad uh, it all worked out. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, really appreciate it. Look forward to to the continuing conversation here in the group and the next summer. Awesome. All right. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bye.